Hey, welcome everyone to a lecture on international and national frameworks to manage coastal ocean, oceans in Australia. So in outline, what I'm going to cover in this lecture, I'm going to cover six broad topics, uh, finishing with a workshop where we'll look at maritime zones and control of, I, I picked spearfishing in the Whitsundays, just as an example of, let's look at an activity, if you're going to go spearfishing in the Whitsundays, how is it regulated? So before we get there though, we're going to start with an overview of a frame, if you like, for thinking of marine and coastal laws as a jigsaw puzzle that you bring together to solve problems. And then I want to spend a little bit of time on the origins of maritime zones and marine protected areas and talk to you about the Bering Fur Seals arbitration back in 1893. It might seem a long time ago, but it's really been the, the foundation for modern Mar well, marine planning and marine protected areas. So it's a useful case just to see what happened and how we get to where we are now. And that leads us into the modern framework for maritime zones under the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, big international framework uh, agreed in 1982 and under it countries can claim maritime zones uh, the most important of which for fisheries is the exclusive economic zone which can extend out to 200 nautical miles from a country's coastline. And UNCLOS is really good at regulating fisheries within EEZs. It's really weak on regulating fisheries outside EEZs. And so outside EEZs in what are called the high seas, there's a whole range of other international treaties dealing with specific fisheries such as, I'm going to choose one uh, example, the uh, Convention on the Conservation of the Southern Bluefin Tuna, just as an example of a high seas um, fishery and its regulation. So UNCLOS is a really important overall framework to understand. And with that background, we're then going to dive into marine coastal laws in Queensland. I've given you a handout with a summary of the major um, fisheries controls built around marine protected areas and a whole range of other restrictions on fishing. And uh, we'll also touch on coastal planning and um, a bit about um, dams and fish barriers because obviously they are very important or critical for fisheries management. The idea that you know, we can just manage the fishery when it's in the, in the marine environment is obviously a fallacy, particularly for species that um, breed uh, in, the tr in rivers and creeks, you need to control um, particularly big dams and any fish barrier, where it's, whether it's a weir or whatever, there can be even just small obstacles in creeks that can effectively prevent fish getting you know, to huge parts of their potential habitat because of a simple road crossing that has rocks in it that the fish can't get past. So that's a really important component of our overall fisheries management. I also just want to touch on climate change uh, at the end. I know you deal with climate change in a lot of courses and no doubt Daniel's talked about it in this course, but I couldn't leave fisheries and legislation, sorry, the law regulating um, coastal and marine environments, I think without mentioning climate change because it's just so significant and so badly done and it's going to have such implications for you know the failures that we have right now under the Paris Agreement and the two degree target that we're setting have such fundamental implications for um, marine and coastal management and then we'll get to our workshop. Does that sound cool? Okay, a key message that I really want to emphasize is that managing coastal areas and fisheries is hard, bloody hard extremely hard if I could put a because can anyone think of a better uh, adjective than that like diabolically hard uh, it has many components and, and it's also very political so there's often a big difference between what the law says on, on paper and what happens actually in practice uh, the law reflects that hard many component political nature and uh, as I say what's what the laws say on paper and what happens in practice are often two very different things. I just mentioned also that 
Uh, I'm going to touch on international fisheries laws, but they're covered in more detail. I teach a course in summer semester international regulatory frameworks, uh, EMVM 3104 and 7124. It yeah, just runs over summer semester. It's a little block of um, lectures at the start uh, and then a research paper and an exam at the end. So uh, you're really welcome to come and join that course, but um, all the lectures from last year are on my YouTube channel. Uh, so there's a lecture about UNCLOS, there's a lecture about um, MARPOL 73, 78, the major international marine pollution from shipping laws. So anyway, that's a, a reference for you if you like. Uh, a preliminary point I'd make before I jump into the laws, but, but it's really a fundamental factual problem that the law has to grapple with, is that we have really big problems in conceptualising how complex systems operate. And I love this quote, it was from a, a paper by John Shearman a few years ago about communicating climate change risks. And I thought this quote I found really insightful and um, I'll just read it. Whereas complex systems such as marine and coastal environments and climate are dynamic, tightly coupled, governed by feedback, non-linear, self-organising, adaptive and evolving, our mental models tend to be static and narrow. We, and by that I mean the public and political decision makers, but even experts, scientific experts, we are often unaware of the delayed and distal impacts of our decisions. We overemphasise the local and the short term. So you will know that from your own experience. You know, you know that if there is a, you know, if there was a tiger running towards you, uh, you would be pretty bloody good at running at that point. You know, you'd be off and trying to get up a tree. So we're good at responding to that immediate threat. But when it's, you know, climate change, we know it's having massive impacts and it's going to have tremendous impacts for future generations. It's having huge impacts now. But it's not the tiger running through the door. So, and it's complex, multi-layered, multifaceted, bloody difficult to deal with. So, that's a fundamental factual problem that we struggle to deal with, our political system struggles to deal with, and the legal system struggles to deal with. In that preliminary context, can I start with an overview, a frame of reference? of thinking of marine and coastal laws as a jigsaw puzzle. I like metaphors. I think well, metaphors are how we often conceptualise complex problems. So uh, I'll try and use some good metaphors um, through this lecture and the idea of a jigsaw puzzle is a really good one. There's, I'd suggest three broad ways that people think about um, the environmental legal system, including marine and coastal. There's the first type, which I'll call government departmental silos. So does anyone here work for government? Great. So when I, I did a science and law degree here at UQ um, back um, predating the dinosaurs when we used to chip, so we didn't come to a nice lecture room like this. We were all out in the quadrangle with, with a stone tablet and we used to chip our notes away. So you, it was really hard in those days. But I did science and law and my first job uh, I got was I went up to Townsville and worked as an environmental officer for the Queensland Department of Environment uh, implementing the Queensland Environmental Protection Act and what I, I saw in when working for government was when you work for government you're often are really good at, at knowing what your law says but you know very little about what other departments are doing and the laws they implement and if someone asks you a question about a law that another department is implementing you'll say oh we can't tell you about that you've got to go and talk with whatever department is, administers it, or you've got to go and talk with local government. And you'll see that if you look at any government websites, because you'll find that most government websites are really good with detailed information about the laws that they administer, but they rarely have links, let alone a comprehensive explanation of the overall system and other parts. So government tend to think in silos. It's just a natural way of you know, how a government is organised. And it's a real problem because often, you know, you can have whole of government working committees and like to try and work on solving complex problems, but ultimately the, the departments tend to operate in these separate silos. Is that your experience? So that's one way of thinking and it's a reality of how government often works and it's a problem. Another 
way of thinking about overall environmental law is what I'll call traditional descriptive categories, things like pollution, fisheries, biodiversity, uh, and the like. You, if you pick up any textbook on environmental law, or even you, you can get whole textbooks on fisheries law, they're in these descriptive traditional categories, which is all useful at a simplistic level. The problem is that modern laws and also environmental problems don't reflect those categories. So just as with, you know, like if you've got a book on fisheries laws, you know, if it ignored laws, coastal development laws, you know, things for like building dams and the like, well, it's not really, you know, if it's just focused on the laws that regulate someone throwing a line in or a net in and catching fish, it's actually not covering all the laws that protect fisheries. And it's actually quite misleading because you tend to think of then fisheries management in this little silo. So traditional categories are useful at a simplistic level. The problem is they don't reflect reality. You need some way though to think of this big complicated system. And, and a way that I suggest is useful is to think of it as a jigsaw and map it without categories. And what I've given you as a handout on in Appendix 1 is a little diagram that comes from a book I wrote a while back um, called Synopsis of the Queensland Environmental Legal System. And what it has is a short summary of all the main laws, the major pieces of environmental law in Queensland. And how I like to explain and think about the overall legal system is to think of it in four levels. International law, our national laws, the state laws, and then in our system, the common law. So um, we inherited our legal system from England, so many other countries, Papua New Guinea, um, many Commonwealth countries have also inherited a common law system, so judge-made law. So things like native title and the like, we get through the common law system. But most of our environmental laws are created under laws of parliament, acts of parliament called legislation. And so the Commonwealth and state laws are where you get most of the controls on the ground. International law isn't binding on individual people, it's binding on Australia as a nation. But if you go out and um, drop a big um, container of cyanide in the Great Barrier Reef and kill a big reef, you haven't breached the World Heritage Act because it binds Australia but you could well have, and you will have, breached a whole range of national and state laws because international law is, has to be implemented through domestic legislation. So international law is really important in placing obligations on Australia and cooperation between other countries and for giving us, particularly the United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, internationally recognised maritime boundaries where we can control fisheries within a particular area, but the specific obligations come under domestic laws. So that four-layered approach um, I, I find really useful. Uh, I know a, a number of friends of mine, colleagues, said that this, they find this useful. They just put it up in their workstation just as a reference point. So it, you see it doesn't have categories. It's just got all of the main laws listed in alphab alphabetical order. And the idea is, basically, if you think of, come back to that, if you think about problem solving as building up a jigsaw where there's all these different bits that you that will be involved in solving the problem and it doesn't matter whether they've got the word fisheries in their title they might be called environmental protection act they might be called the water act they might be called anything if it's relevant to your problem you, it's basically part of what you need to be aware of so don't get stuck in categories and you can build up this jigsaw um, I was just going to mention this um, complex jurisdictional limits in the marine environment. Basically, uh, it's really complicated where the laws ultimately apply to national and state laws and different, different laws apply at different tidal limits, but also out to three nautical miles and then to the edge of the Great Barrier Reef um, region and then out to 200 nautical miles. Don't need to get caught up in that at this stage, I just mentioned it. So there's all these laws, they apply in different areas, it's complicated. Uh, don't be stressed about the complexity. 
uh, think of it as an overall jigsaw that you've got to solve. Hopefully that reference diagram is useful for you. I would mention before going on to talk about international law, the need for a reset, because it's crystal clear our laws are failing. We've got ongoing massive biodiversity loss, uh, huge problems with climate change. We've got systemic failure at multiple levels in the system. And uh, in the last couple of years, there's been a lot of um, work by uh, Australian conservation groups calling for new national environmental laws and a new national environmental protection agency to try and make the administration of Australia's national laws more independent from the political you know, machinery that uh, really inhibits its current operation. And I've come around to thinking, yeah, there is a need for a reset. Uh, I think that there is a lot of good things in our current system that we should keep, but the bottom line is we're failing and uh, yeah, there is a need for a reset. I'm not going to dwell on though criticising the law, I really want to just get on to well, what the law is now, what do you have to deal with when you're working in this area. Okay, so let's start with the origins of maritime zones and marine protected areas. So the Bering Fur Seal Arbitration in 1893. I love this quote from uh, Gillian Triggs, fantastic, one of Australia's best international uh, lawyers. Uh, she was also very famous. She was the chair of the Human Rights Commission um, uh, for many years recently. She got attacked by the Abbott government for standing up for shock <laughs> refugees and um, a range of other things. Uh, but yeah, amazing, uh, amazing lady. So Gillian Triggs wrote in a great book um, back in 2006, International Law, Contemporary Principles and Practices. The international law of the sea ebbs and flows with the evolving geopolitical priorities of the age. It's such a beautiful imagery, ebbs and flows. So in the ebbing and flowing, a really important um, point of reference is the Bering um, Fur Seal Arbitration in 1893. So the Bering Strait is the strait that lies between Russia and Alaska. and uh, the dispute involved the Privilof Islands, which I've circled there in red. So, just a bit of background. Bering Strait was named after uh, an early explorer who went through there in 1741. Now, just imagine going through there in a sailing ship with no navigation systems. Uh, yeah, basically incredibly dangerous area. And, uh, yeah, he sailed through. Uh, he is third and final he died on his second voyage. Uh, but yeah, a, the strait is named after him. And a um, little bit of context as well, relevant to the story. This is the check um, from the US to Russia to purchase Alaska in 1867. So Russia originally uh, owned Alaska and they basically, they, ran, they, they sold it to the US in 1867. Uh, and it was a huge controversy at the time. The um, government of the day was roundly criticised. Um, one New York newspaper that year called Alaska a sucked orange, saying Russia had already drained it of all the value out of it. Uh, and the, the purchase was known as Seawood's Icebox. Seawood was the Secretary of State at the time. So obviously that was before the gold rush and obviously oil. So. Uh, it was mainly about um, particularly furs at that time. So Russia had settled a lot of the area. So the Privilof Islands has got a Russian sounding name because it had been settled by Russia. And, and here's a couple of images of it. So um, pretty desolate, cold looking place, windswept. So this is a fur seal. And here's a fur seal rookery. And here's some images uh, drawn from um, the islands back in the 1850s and this is, can you see these um, pictures the, in the top left is um, seal meat uh, and th here's a killing gang at work so they would go out and club the seals to death and then cure them for their meat and also for their um, furs and so basically they obliterated the rookeries on the islands to the point where the um, US, which now owned Alaska and the islands, became so concerned about the fur seals that they tried to implement conservation measures 
to um, protect them. And the problem was, one of the problems was that the fur seals didn't stay on land. They'd, you know, dam those seals. They'd swim out to sea. And when they swam out to sea, um, vessels from other nations would come and kill them. So the US tried to argue uh, with um, the UK actually at the time in, in its the UK um, controlled Canada and the US got in a dispute with Canada about vessels that were coming from Canada to kill the seals and the US tried to argue that because the seals lived on their islands when they swam out to sea there was still the property of the US and others couldn't kill them and it went to arbitration and the arbitration panel came up with essentially a plan for conserving the seals. So they um, said that they're between the US and the um, in Canada, the UK, um, UK that uh, there should be a prohibited zone, uh, a closed season in a defined area of the high seas with exceptions for indigenous hunting, uh, a limitation on the type of vessel used, a licensing system for seal hunting, the use of a special flag while sealing, keeping of catch records, exchange of data collected, government responsibility for choice of suitable crews, and a plan to be enacted into national uniform laws in the US and Britain and national measures adopted to inf ensure enforcement, and a three-year ban or moratorium on all sealing. If you look at those measures, they were absolutely groundbreaking f for the time. And they really lay the foundation. You could, you could actually look at all of those things, and if you looked at any marine protected system around the world, it would have elements of those sorts of things in it. So this was an absolutely groundbreaking um, decision at the time. However, it didn't work. Um, it was ineffective because the US and British Canadian vessels re-registered in Japan and other countries to avoid being subject to US and Canadian laws and basically continued to um, carry out sealing and the seal population continued to decline until there was an international convention in uh, 1911. So, and that is also one of the m massive problems with high seas fisheries now is what are called flags of convenience. So a country like Australia might have strong national laws uh, uh, applying to fisheries management and it might apply, we can apply our laws to vessels that are registered in Australia wherever they go in the world. So if a company wants to avoid Australian laws, then it goes in to a country that doesn't have strong laws, let's just say Zimbabwe, and Z pays Zimbabwe you know, some nominal fee for a fishing license which has no conditions, uh, well, and registers the vessel in Zimbabwe, and then is subject, while on the high seas, to Zimbabwean law. So what are called flags of convenience are still a massive problem for fisheries management. So the Bering First Sales Arbitration really both laid the foundation for modern fisheries management laws, but it also <laughs> showed us one of the Achilles, you know, the Achilles heel of fisheries management, which is uh, the difficulty of controlling um, uh, nationals of other countries on the high seas. So. Uh, since the Bering Fur Seals arbitration, international law has expanded the maritime zones of countries. Back in 1893, the maritime zones that were recognised were three nautical miles, which many of you might know. Well, does anyone know what, where does the three nautical mile limit come from? It was, I think it was in the 1700s, it was the, it was the limit that a cannon could fire at that time. And so it was considered the limit of what could be uh, the area that could be controlled from the land. Because if you couldn't fire a cannon any further, you couldn't control it from the land. And countries like uh, Britain, Spain, and France, that were all big um, sa maritime nations at the time, they wanted to limit the control that other nations had over the seas. So they wanted a small maritime zones. And so three nautical miles was around for centuries. But then it's been expanded since then. In, in um, 1972, uh, it was expanded to 12 nautical miles in an international case about Icelandic fisheries. And then in 1982, 
it was expanded to 200 nautical miles. So under UNCLOS, countries can control fisheries within 200 nautical miles. And a nautical mile is about, does anyone know how, how long a nautical mile is? So we all know that the US still uses miles. So we've got kilometers. So how much is a mile? It's 1,600 meters. Does anyone know how much an, a nautical mile is? No. It's bigger. Anyone want to hazard a guess? It's, a, it's about 1,862 metres. Any, want, anyone want to hazard a guess why they got this stupid random number? It's actually not a stupid random number. It's the distance of, I think it's one meridian at the equator. And it comes from the time when ships used to navigate, you know, using celestial navigation and and um, you know they didn't just pull a GPS out of your pocket and say, oh, I'm there, 200 meters and three inches off that reef. Uh, so um, nautical miles has a historical, yeah, an origin in essentially maritime, um, yeah, well, maritime history. I think going in circles there. Okay, so the modern framework for maritime zones under UNCLOS now, that's what we get to. So just a couple of basics about UNCLOS, cover this more, as I said, in the um, International Regulatory Frameworks course. But UNCLOS is a really, really, really important international framework. So it took 10 years to reach agreement on. It was signed in uh, 1982. It's got 167 parties, not including the US, which continues to be a big problem for the US. The US claims 200 nautical miles uh, as a EZ, but they haven't actually, they're not a party to UNCLOS. They've got a, the US has got, a, I'm sure everyone knows, uh, everyone, the US has this crazy political system and um, their Senate controls um, the ability of the executive of the day to sign up to international treaties and uh, the US Senate for the last few decades has been hostile to pretty well anything international. The fact that it's got the words United Nations at the start of the treaty doesn't help its cause at all and effectively the Senate has blocked the US ratifying UNCLOS for decades. Uh, but it's still a massive treaty. Australia's a signatory. Virtually every country in the world, other than the US, that has a coastline is a party to the US. Sorry, to UNCLOS. Uh, so UNCLOS is really big. It's got 320 articles uh, plus nine annexes. The most important for environmental management are basically those ones I've summarised there. You don't need to worry about them. Um, I've given you on your handout a representation of I think that with a key. So you can see down there the, the key, um, it's not shown on this, that slide, it's, uh, you can see the, 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 the key maritime zones. So you might just want to scribble on that. So EZ is essentially the cream areas. So the exclusive economic zone is really the only maritime zone you need to worry about for fisheries management because the basic thing with UNCLOS is countries are what's called a coastal state, such as Australia, so any country with a coastline can claim an exclusive economic zone out to 200 nautical miles. Now, you get less than 200 nautical miles if there's another country that, that has a boundary that's or has a coastline that's closer than 400 nautical miles to you. So if you look at Papua New Guinea in the northern part of that image, see how Papua New Guinea, there's no cream. Obviously, the distance from uh, Australia's coastline to Papua New Guinea is far less than 200 nautical miles. So the EZ comes right back. And you can see in the Coral Sea, that's why it looks, there's, there's areas that are different distances because we, sh we have a, um, we're in proximity to other countries. But then you see down at the bottom of Australia, like around Tasmania, um, the full 200 nautical mile EZ. And then the, the bluer areas uh, are the continental shelf. So the continental shelf can also um, be claimed under UNCLOS, but it doesn't give you control of fisheries 
you can control oil and gas extraction from the seafloor on your continental shelf, but you can't control fishing above the continental shelf area. So from a fisheries perspective, it's the EZ that's really important. The other boundaries, such as the territorial sea and coastal waters, are, are important in, in other areas, but not really for fisheries. The, the EZ is a big one. So um, that's a, I didn't give you this diagram in your, in, as a handout, um, but that's just a summary of, you can see the EZ and the high seas going out from a, um, a, a um, coastline. So um, here's a map of Australia's maritime zones and uh, you can see that the cream area uh, of the EZ is enormous. So Australia can control an enormous area of um, the world's oceans through its laws and then essentially control through a licensing system both protect the, the species within those areas but also then get money from the catches in those areas as well. Okay, so I don't want to dwell on maritime zones. Um, the simple point is EZ can control fisheries 200 nautical miles. If you can remember that, it's pretty well all you need to know about unclosing fisheries, I think. Here's a map of Australia's marine park network within. You can see that it's all within our EZ, and uh, Australia's declared a whole range of about 60 um, marine protected areas, including the Great Barrier Reef Marine Protected Area. So just to summarise about UNCLOS, you, you really need to distinguish between um, within the EEZ, UNCLOS is really strong, outside it's really weak. So outside the, the national maritime zones, they're called the high seas. It does sound a bit like a movie, doesn't it? But it's actually what it's called. Um, so the, on the high seas, UNCLOS is weak. And there's a patchwork of trees applying to different fisheries. So let's have a look at an example of enforcement. Um, within Australia's EEZ is actually where Australia slightly broke or bent, bent to the point of breaking UNCLOS. Um, it, it involved an arrest of a Russian flagged vessel by this ship, HMS Canberra, which is now I think a great dive site off Western Australia. It's no longer, it's been decommissioned, but here's a picture of it back in 2002. And so Australian authorities got wind of some Russian flag vessels that were illegally fishing for Patagonian toothfish down in Heard and McDonald Islands, which are about 4,000 kilometres southwest of Perth and Australian islands. So uh, Australia sent down the HMS Canberra, which intercepted, there were two vessels, um, Canberra intercepted one, and then it obviously radioed to its sister ship, and it was, the sister ship was hightailing for the high seas, trying to get outside 200 nautical miles. Because UNCLOS is a bit archaic in the sense that even if you find, you have to essentially intercept a vessel within your EEZ to be able to um, board it. If it's not flagged in your, if it's not one of your vessels, you can't board a ship of another country on the high seas. You, you, you can if you commence, again, What's, it's called hot pursuit, it really is called hot pursuit, it's not just like a Dukes of Hazard um, term that I'm making up. If you commence hot pursuit within your EEZ, then you can still arrest it. And um, so this vessel was hightailing it for um, the high seas and it just, and, and Canberra launched a helicopter after it. And hot pursuit has to be commenced, you can't just like radio them and say, you know, vessel in our seas, you know, stop and we're going to board you from 100 nautical miles away. You've, you've, got, to, you've got to do it visually or audibly. Um, so you have to basically be within, not quite touching distance, but you know, very close to be able to begin hop a shoot. So Canberra launched a helicopter after it and it got to the vessel when it was about 500 metres outside Australia's EEZ. Um, you can see just here the Australia's EEZ is in cream. The Kogul Islands. Why do you reckon, wh wh why is the map this way? Okay, who do you think the Kogul Islands belong to? No? Good, good guess though. France. Yep. So you can see that we split the EEZ between them. 
Okay, this is Heard McDonald Islands. They're very, very inhospitable. Here's a picture of the... Um, and I'm going to play you a bit of footage. So this was such an interesting story. I asked the um, uh, Australian Navy to give me any pictures they've got. And I just happened to luck out the guy who was managing media for the Australian Navy at the time also happened to be one of the officers involved in the operation and he sent me basically a video that they'd taken so it's not very prof it's not particularly um, it's a bit rough but you'll get the idea So the noise cuts out in a bit. So this is when the helicopters caught up to the Volga and basically they radioed back to the vessel and said, they're outside the EZ, what should we do? The vessel, the HMS Canberra contacted um, Canberra and Canberra said to board them anyway. So it's actually in breach of international law, but you know, leaving aside minor technical things like that, what happened? So this is the, the um, helicopter basically circled them. But, you know, they're in the middle of the ocean. You don't really want to board them um, without a big buddy in the background. So they waited until the HMS Canberra caught up. And then they returned to the Canberra. And the next bit of footage is when the helicopter has gone back. So this is the Canberra. And they're getting ready to launch another helicopter. So you see in the moment the Volga is just off the bow of the Canberra, so basically they're going to board it, but they've got a warship <laughs> standing right beside them, so if there's any trouble. Um, and here's the boarding party getting ready to go. So obviously they're in the Southern Ocean, extremely cold. If you fall in the water, you don't have long to live. So they're all in survival suits, uh, armed. instructions on what to do with the... This is them going out to um, the helicopter. If anyone's been in the Army or Navy, then you know that there's a whole heap of little pr well, procedures they do to keep people safe. That's one of them. Um, so here's the helicopter taking off. And you'll see the Volga in a moment. So just off the bow of the Canberra. And basically, they don't actually land on it. They, what they do, it's called fast roping. They throw a rope out, and then there's no repelling device. They just basically grab it with gloves, a big thick rope, and you slide down. And I particularly like when the first guy goes down, because, <laughs> because you see him start out, okay? And you might notice that he doesn't seem to be above the vessel, and then he stops. And I think he's waving, you know, over there, you an idiot, it's good go. I'm like hanging on here, just to a rope in the middle of the southern ocean over there. And the helicopter just sort of moves across a bit. And then the guy's going, oh my god, thanks, I can go down, my arms are going to give out. So anyway, the rest come down. I'll just jump ahead. Then they launch a, um, a, ve a vessel goes across, you can see having a big warship beside you is <laughs> pretty good insurance policy. And then there's the, best, there's the helicopter. And then they basically went under the, under the um, decks. Here's some, these are some of the guys from the Australian Marine Fisheries Authority uh, who went on board with the sailors. And basically the Volga presented them with a log which said that they hadn't been doing any fishing within Australian waters. They were just basically what's called innocent passage. They were going through Australia's waters, not fishing. The um, IT people um, managed to download the actual log, the computer log, which showed that essentially the paper log that the Russians had given them was completely false and that they'd been fishing all through in Australian waters for like weeks. Um, and also when they, you can see 
I think the guy there in blue is a naval officer and the guy in grey is with the Australian Fisheries Management Authority. Anyway, they went below decks and the things like the, um, they used long lines for cutting, catching Patagonian toothfish. The, the, there were evidence that was presented in later court cases with things like the lines were wet, freshly baited, um, the fish that were attached to the hooks were still not alive but still you know still movable so they'd obviously just recently been caught blood came from their gills when their gills were open so they're obviously just recently dead and anyway this is all just film that they're gathering for evidence you can see all of the they're going through the freezer rooms these are all toothfish and then yeah they're just looking at and then this is when the vessels get back to Perth so they sailed them back. So, anyone got any thoughts on that? Like, for one thing, how much do you reckon that would have cost? To go down and catch this vessel. A lot of money, hey. It's difficult in a remote location and really hard. And that really reflects a lot of fisheries enforcement. You know, sure, Heard McDonald Islands are an extreme, but you go 50 nautical miles out to sea or, or 100, it's a long way to go. It's difficult. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of ocean out there. So regulating fisheries is bloody hard and expensive. So they're just some still pictures. Um, it led on to a range of court cases. Um, Australia got a rap on the knuckles for, yeah, when Russia took Australia to the International um, Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Um, there's a case study of it if you're interested on my website. I won't, don't need to dwell on it. Um, I really just want to use it because it's a, you know, the footage of it's really um, compelling, powerful, isn't it? To look at how difficult it is to actually go and stop these illegal, this illegal fishing. So, that's, yep. Did Russia get any fines for that? No, Russia didn't get any fines for it, um, but at the same time, Russia didn't. Uh, so the court case was about releasing the vessel, but Russia never actually argued the point that Australia had arrested the vessels um, on the high seas. Then it, the, the court case wasn't actually about that. And the, probably the obvious reason why Russia didn't do that was because it was bloody obvious that the um, vessels were fishing in Australian waters illegally and, you know, the evidence was overwhelming. Um, but, yeah, there was no, there's no fines as such so against Russia. So did not take them to court because they were caught outside of the boundaries? Uh, no, Australia di Australia's got some really strong laws. So under Australian laws, the vessels were automatically forfeited to the Australian government. And the court case was about those forfeiture laws and essentially, essentially prompt release of the vessel because Australia wanted to hold them on a, uh, on a, uh, wanted a massive bond, um, several million dollars. And they also wanted them to be fitted with a vessel monitoring device. And um, the company didn't want to do that, and um, that's been one of the big, one of the bugbears of um, of UNCLOS and the fisheries management regime has been vessel monitoring devices, and whether they can be compelled to be fitted or not, and you know, sort of things like if if a vessel is flying without a flag, then anyone can board it because it's basically deemed to be like a pirate vessel. If you're not registered in any country. But you know, can't, why can't we have that if you're if you're sailing without a vessel monitoring device um, that's active? Why can't any country board it? Um, you know, there's a lot of ways that international fisheries laws could be improved significantly. But essentially, there's a lot of countries that aren't that interested in better management of other people's fisheries effectively. So, or you know, the high seas around other countries. And they're quite happy. China, um, well, South Korea, Malaysia, you know, a lot of countries have got huge 
fishing vessels that you know and fishing fleets that go around the world pretty well um, you know destroying um, fisheries and they're not that interested in improving the current poor system I mean there are pushes for better high seas fisheries management um, but yeah whether they get up and when they get up another question okay uh, can I just perch briefly on so on the high seas so that, that, that was a really, that example was really about fish management within the EZ, even though it technically crossed into the high seas. But if you're just in the high seas, no link to the EZ directly, then basically you can't board vessels that aren't registered in your country, unless you've got an agreement with the country that they are registered in. And so what countries have done for fisheries that have suffered massive declines in the high seas, the main fishing nations have, in many cases, have agreed on a, a international convention to better regulate and assign quotas to the, um, the vessels from each nation. A good example of that is the Convention for the Southern Bluefin Tuna. So beautiful um, species, the Southern Bluefin Tuna, um, grows to massive lengths, um, it's found in the Southern Ocean, so there's a distribution of it. Um, they spawn between Java and Indonesia and Western Australia and then they, they move south along the West Australian coast uh, and into the Great Australian Bight and then obviously around in the Southern Ocean. They're uh, incredibly sought after as you know. So here's, you, you can see in the background there those pens. So it's been quite common for in recent times for fishing vessels to go out and put a, a net around a school of essentially smaller tuna and then drag the net back into a coastal area into pens and then feed them and grow them and then harvest them when they're big enough. So you can see there a pen and, and it's pretty obvious that these ones have been harvested. Um, they do have some big problems with both um, yeah, pollution from those pens but also you know, things like sharks like to jump into the pens and have a good old feed. Um, and yeah, so very valuable, particularly in Japan. So here's um, an example from 2013, a sushi restaurant um, bid a record um, 155 million yen, about 1.7 million Australian dollars for a 222 kilogram tuna um, at the first sale for 2013. So incredibly, you know, 1.7 million dollars for that fish. And they've been massively overfished. They've declined to less than 10% of their biomass in 1960. And most of that fishing has been done by Japan. Australia is the second largest um, country fishing southern bluefin tuna. And yeah, I don't need to go into the background, but it's very controversial. Regularly, you'll see on the news um, each, each time, about this time of year, there's um, the meetings of the um, the Convention on the Conservation of Southern Bluefin Tuna, and it's often really controversial how the um, quotas are allocated. You can go and have a look at their website. I don't want to dwell on it though, but essentially um, there's some, you know, uh, there's an expert scientific advisory committee that tells them what has happened to the um, stock and what is expected under different um, catch regimes. So this is some modeling from 2009, it was presented at the 14th meeting of the Scientific Committee for the Convention. And you can see there what it shows is, so it was presented in 2009 and the different um, lines are modelled results for what the stock will do under different um, total um, fishing regimes. So the red one is where you've got basically high fishing and it basically the, the species is expected to go functionally extinct by the mid 2020s, and then if you if you the black one is if you just had no take, then it would recover the quickest. And in between that, there's different takes uh, are different rates of recovery. So, uh, and they basically agreed in that year on the middle one that would pretty well keep it not sending it into extinction, but they couldn't agree on zero take, even though when you look at it, you think, well, that's probably a pretty sensible thing. Let's have a moratorium for five years and see what happens. It would be a really sensible thing, but they can't agree on that because there's too much money involved. So we're basically going to play Russian roulette with the whole stock. But yeah, it's, uh, 
mm, massive, massive problem. And there's similar issues for many other fisheries, other tuna fisheries, so the Pacific tuna industry. Um, this is an article from 2014, calls for drastic action to avoid big eye stock collapse. In a nutshell, international law, think about it in terms of UNCLOS, and that gives national maritime zones outside that on the high seas really difficult to regulate a lot of fisheries like tuna and there are a whole range of other conventions like lots. Okay so let's focus within Queensland. Okay so we're going to come within our Australian maritime zones and then focus on Queensland and I've given you a, a handout um, with I just tried to do a summary on two pages. If you turn to the second page you'll see there a, a list of dot points and this is what I really struggled with. I was saying uh, to Daniel that I spent about 10 hours working on this lecture because I actually find it really hard to explain these laws in any sort of sensible way that's comprehensive, correct, and as simple as it can be without being so simple that it's actually wrong. So what I've tried to do there in those dot points, which I've, in this slide I've just got the, 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 the terms that are bolded, but essentially I've tried, tried to pick out what I see as the major terms. It actually spans a whole range of pieces of legislation. So commercial fishing licenses in Queensland waters are mainly um, provided under the Fisheries Act 1994, a state piece of legislation. But then marine parks, there's three big bits of legislation that create them. There's the um, Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Act, which creates the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park. There's also state marine parks, so Moreton Bay is a marine park, so adjacent to Brisbane, and that's under the State Marine Parks Act. And then there's also some other marine parks created under the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, part of the Australian Marine Parks Network. Uh, so the Coral Sea has a big marine park over it. And also there's a couple of marine parks in the Gulf of Carpentaria. So there's a whole range of marine parks, but essentially what marine parks do is they create zoning plans. And the Great Barrier Reef is often used as the model internationally for multi-use marine park planning. So you'll have some areas that are general use and allow commercial fishing, all the way down to green zones, which there's no take by recreational fishers or commercial fishers and a range of zones in between. So zoning plans in marine parks is a cornerstone of our planning, um, but then there's a whole range of other things that apply as well. So regulated waters under the Fisheries Act, there's a whole range of regulated waters where, for instance, there's dugong protected areas where there's limits on commercial netting because there's problems with dugongs getting wrapped in nets in, certain, you know, in lots of places. So these dugong protection areas are created under the Fisheries Act. Then under the Fisheries Act, there's a whole range of other things. So size limits, so fish, you, some fish you can't catch until they're over a certain size, and then some, like barramundi, have a maximum size as well, because the big fish, why do you think we have a maximum size for barramundi? Yep, they're actually the really crucial ones for the maintenance of the population, because does anyone not being a fisheries biologist, but my understanding is barramundi change sex when they get to about 50 centimetres. So all the small ones are males and the larger ones change sex to females because females are actually much more important for the population reproduction because one female has a huge impact. So basically you kill all the males off, you know, because there's mass mortality in the younger ones and then the ones that survive, the ones that are successful are the females. Wouldn't it be great if like humans did that? You know, we could then have all the males would be killed off and by the time they're 20, like all the males are gone. And then, you know, the sensible females would be like the leaders. So we could, anyway, it's an idea, but we don't do that. So um, there's maximum limits sometimes. And um, so size limits, bag limits. So if you go fishing, you can only get, you know, six of a particular species or whatever. Um, closed seasons uh, as well, so prohibit the taking of some specie, species during spawning times. Um, uh, other 
gear restrictions such as maximum net lengths, the gauge of nets. Remember my dad was arrested for putting a set net in, we lived up in the Whitsundays and he went with a mate and they put a, a net across a creek um, and I think it was too small and, and it was also too big and a fisheries officer picked them up when they came back and they got charged with um, so the size of the hole in the net and also its length those sorts of things are regulated particularly for recreational fishers essentially to make it so that you can't have big nets that catch everything we, we actually we, so we regulate fishing to make it harder to catch fish because Otherwise, essentially, the fishing effort would destroy the fisheries too quickly. So gear restrictions. Um, there's also uh, also gear restrictions. There's also some prohibitions on fishing, like using explosives or poisons. So in some um, Pacific countries, you know the story with explosives. So explosives have been used quite extensively on fishing on coral reefs. So you throw in a stick of dynamite, the explosion sends a Percussion, no, concussion wave, isn't it? Whichever wave stuns the fish and they float up to the surface and then you go around and you just scoop them up off the surface. Also, things like cyanide can be used to stun fish and they float up to the surface and you just pick them up. Not that, I don't think I'd be that keen to eat a fish that had been, you know, you'd fished it with cyanide, but anyway, it's, so those things are prohibited um, for pretty obvious reasons uh, in, in Queensland waters, so, um, gear restrictions. There's some fish that if you catch them you're not allowed to release them so if you catch a tilapia you're supposed to kill it and you're not supposed to leave it somewhere where it can get where it's can get back into the water. So tilapia, carp and gambusia so exotic fish are to, um, yeah, um, noxious fish. Some um, sexes are protected so I think every Australian or Queensland fisherman, fishing person would know if you catch a female mud crab, you've got to let it go. And you can tell it if it's a female from basically you turn it over and it's, if it's got like a moon rather than a more of a V in its shell, uh, then it's a female and you've got to let it go. And we let it go because it's about protecting the, the species. Um, because the females again are so much more important for reproduction than the males. Um, there's also protected species like dugongs, whales, dolphins and turtles. Um, there's some traditional hunting rights around dugongs and turtles in particular. Um, and also marine plants such as mangroves and fish habitat areas are also protected. So you can see there's a whole range of complicated laws. Um, and that's just a summary. Any questions on that? In our workshop, we'll just have a look at how those things sort of work together in the context of spearfishing in the Whitsundays. So if you're going to go fishing somewhere and you're just a recreational fisher, if you're a commercial, if you want to go and catch fish and sell them, you're a commercial fisher and you need a license. But if you're a recreational fisher in Queensland, you don't need a license in the marine environment. There are some inland waters where you might need a license, but in the marine environment, you don't need a license, but you need to comply with all of these other restrictions. So you need to know where you're going in terms of whether there's restrictions on zones or other things that you can and can't do. So we'll work through that. I mentioned before there's this marine park network around Australia. It's been very controversial over the last decade. The current government has watered it down again, or the current government, not the one as of last week, not even the one like six months before that. I think the one maybe three governments ago under Abbott watered it down. Yeah, but I know that was only 12 months ago in total. Um, so, um, it's right on um, four o'clock. Um, I want to get to um, our workshop, um, but I'm also conscious that um, we've been going for an hour. Why don't we take a five minute break and get up, stretch your legs, we'll come back and we'll um, talk a bit more about our fisheries laws and then go on to our workshop. Hey, welcome back. Before um, our break, we were talking about uh, Queensland's fisheries laws, and we just 
mentioned the map of um, Australia's marine park network. Just want to mention a couple of things, um, components of those laws. First off, um, protecting fish habitat and fish passage along waterways. And just as a couple of examples, um, this is a picture of some litigation that I was involved in where I was the prosecutor for the Department of Fisheries in essentially fining uh, a fellow who built a marina up in uh, Maribor. Uh, on the, uh, basically, he, built, he wanted to build this marina and he dug out this area of mangroves. So where you see there the gap between the land and the mangroves on the right was essentially he dug it all out, all without approval. He had an, he had an approval for a, a, a marina, but he was meant to leave the mangroves and essentially build the marina out on the river. So he got a fine of $160,000 for doing that. And he breached a number of laws. Um, the Fisheries Act has protection of marine plants including things like mangroves and also the planning laws. So now there's the Planning Act 2016 has similar laws that stop development um, of things, a whole range of things, including damaging marine plants. So those sorts of planning laws, you might see signs up. So just near where I live in Woolloongabba, at the moment they're doing work in a creek. So they've got this little uh, sign up about um, this temporary waterway barrier that they've built and that it's essentially they're indicating to the public that this is done in accordance with the law and just as an example of that a few years ago when the UQ ferry terminal was moved up to its current position so who catches the ferry to get to uni anyone okay only one two so when you um, go down to the ferry terminal when it was built they had to clear some mangroves along the banks of the Brisbane River and this is a picture of sediment fencing to control erosion uh, but also I've got in that little ins inset picture I've just taken a picture of the sign that they had up that basically again says what we're doing is lawful we're removing marine plants but we have an approval for it so those are examples of complying with the law so there's a whole range of laws regulating commercial and recreational fishing as I mentioned uh, can I just give you an example of illegal fishing in Brisbane and then in the workshop we'll talk about the Great Barrier Reef. So this is a picture given to me by the Department of Fisheries of a guy being arrested, or about to be arrested. This is his actual second time he was arrested um, and between the first and the second time he painted his boat green, the fisheries guys were out and they saw him and they thought, oh we know you, and they, this is them pulling up to, up to him. And essentially they picked him up in November 2009 and then in December 2009 the first location was the bottom section, uh, the bottom arrow, and the second one was the top arrow. And so that was in Moreton Bay. Um, the second time he was picked up, he was actually in a national park um, or a marine national park zone where there's no take at all. But what he was charged with wasn't the breach of the um, zoning plan. Um, here's just a couple of closer images of where they um, they first sighted him and then they basically followed him upstream and intercepted him in this creek. And here's the second place he was intercepted. Um, so here's him being intercepted the second time. And here's some pictures of his boat and um, pictures of the fishing apparatus that he had in it. So he was selling his what he caught. So he was a commercial fisherman, but he didn't have a license for it. And also he had a whole range of undersized um, um, crabs as well as female crabs. So this is a summary of uh, he was prosecuted for not being licensed and um, the particulars of the offence where he had 52 undersized mud crabs, 49 female mud crabs, 95 mud crabs in excess of bag limits for recreational fishermen, uh, unmarked crab pots and a commercial fishing net. So all of those things unlawful. Uh, he was fined $30,000 for that and I presume they kept all his equipment as well. They normally impound all of your equipment uh, as well. So um, that's an example of someone being caught and prosecuted. Um, as I said, my dad many years ago. Um, yep, if you're in yeah, there's a whole there's a whole range of, you know, if most fish, most People fishing now, I'd suggest do the right thing, but um, it's 
yeah, there's a whole range of, you know, if you never see a fisheries officer for years and you want that extra coral trout or the like, um, you know, people get greedy and uh, enforcement is essentially essential. There needs to be credible enforcement for the law to be, um, you know, for it to work. Um, so that's fisheries laws. Let's just mention briefly coastal planning. So an example of a, from, again, from another court case I worked on years ago, just after I'd left uni, and my time in the department, it was in the planning environment court. It was a, a cement company up at, um, just inland from Bribey Island, um, just near Pummerstone Passage. This company wanted to um, basically have a sand quarry, and the sand is used in cement manufacture. So um, this was the area, and you can see the intertidal area there marked. The dotted line is where they wanted to dig up. So they're in this low-lying coastal area. So that's essentially the black box is the borders of their property. And you can see where the tide gets to. It actually comes onto their property uh, during, yeah, well, high tide. And all of the areas, like you see there, Bullock Creek in the foreground, are all you know, high conservation fisheries areas, very important for, um, yeah, everyone knows the importance of mangroves and, and those areas for, um, for fisheries. So the problem that locals and um, recreational fishing groups saw with this um, sand mine was if you dig up and change uh, the essentially water flow in those areas and also expose um, acid sulfate soils to, um, oxygen, uh, you can produce um, acidic conditions that can mobilise um, heavy metals that are bound, otherwise bound up in the clays. And so once you get um, things like aluminium mobilised in um, water, effectively you kill anything with gills. So very, really bad for um, prawns and other things. So um, the recreational fishers were really concerned about this proposed mine and um, yeah, this big company um, went to the planning environment court. Anyway, this is basically what they were proposing to do. You can see the outline there. Um, and one of the problems that they had to overcome physically was that um, it was so low uh, and um, that in flood events, the creek to the south, which I think was a Limber Creek, flooded across to Bullock Creek. So in, there would be floodwaters passing across the site. So if they were going to dig big pits, they needed to basically ensure that the floodwaters didn't basically just gouge them out and take all of their sediment and dump it in the fisheries areas. So what they proposed to do was build the um, quarry in stages. They would start in the middle and dig it out, and then they would backfill with the fine slurry. They'd take out the stead process, the, the, um, basically the muck they took out, take out the, f the sand that they wanted, and then everything else that they didn't want, they would put back in to what was going to be a floodway in the middle of the site, so that they would refill it and they would have a graded floodway in the middle. And um, we had, a, or one of the other parties had an expert engineer who said that floodway, you're trying to make it out of muck, and it's not gonna work. A flood will go across it, it'll all gouge out, and you'll end up with all of the fines basically in Pumastone Passage. So groundwater plus flooding issues, this is a nightmare environmentally. And um, anyway, went to court, minus one. A uh, great example of if you throw a few million dollars at um, something, you can get results that just beg a belief. But anyway, they, they got an approval for this project. The end result, though, um, wasn't rosy for the company because ultimately the project failed commer commercially. Um, this is it actually being built in November 2009. Then in 2010, you can see the, um, the orange there. What does that suggest to you? Just looking at orange in a coastal environment, if you see orange, what do you think? You're thinking probably iron and it's been mobilised, um, so changes in acidity can mobilise those things um, from the clays. So that's a pretty clear indication, but contained within sight, but you can see the sorts of things that you're dealing with. 
Um, any engineer, though, will look at an acid sulfate, so so acid sulfate soil problem, or most engineers will look at it and just say, ah, oh, throw a truckload of lime on it and you'll neutralise it. So anything can be treated if you give it enough lime. Uh, so uh, you can see the, the, the dredge basically goes out. It's a cut of suction dredge. You can see it connected to the processing plant here. And they were happily working away. Uh, and then in 2012, they're just clearing the next stage when there was a fire at the um, processing plant. And basically they didn't abandon the site, but it wasn't commercially worth them going back and fixing up the plant. So as of the latest Google Earth image, the site is sitting basically disused um, in the state it was in 2012 when the fire occurred, partially developed. And that's its context. So there's this, you know, it's a crucial fisheries, well, highly significant fisheries area. Every level of fisheries protection applies to Palmerstone Passage. But uh, in my experience, what you get when you've got uh, someone who's got a lot of money and they want to do something, you get the argument that, well, we can do this because our environmental management will be so good there'll be no impact on the adjacent fishery area. So you end up going in and fighting about the science and things like groundwater, flooding, um, civil engineering issues, they all become critical to actually protecting the fisheries area. So um, yeah, emphasise fisheries management, coastal management, obviously it's all interrelated. Coastal projects are often really complicated factually and the science involved in them, the engineering involved is really hard. Another example of really hard is dealing with dams. So I'm only going to touch on this. Um, there's a lecture on my YouTube channel from a lecture I used to give in the course I taught environmental management, sorry, environmental regulation course. It's a lecture on water management. Uh, it goes on for an hour. I just wanted to touch on it though. So this was a river, the Burnett River. This is what it used to look like. And um, this is essentially um, the section where now a big dam stands. Now, if you look at that from a fish, so imagine you're a fish swimming up here. What is that for you? Imagine you're in the water and you're swimming up it as a fish. What are the conditions you're facing in terms of fish passage? Is it flowing very fast? No. So low flow times, maybe a little bit shallow, but you can, if you can swim through, Basically, do you think you've got good fa fish passage between across that area and particularly across here? Do you think that would be good for fish passage? Okay, now imagine you dump a million tons of concrete on that and a 40 meter concrete wall. How do you reckon that goes now for fish passage? Not so good? Okay, well that's what we've done. So we've gone from that to a 40 meter high concrete wall. Um, that's the dam wall from upstream, so that's the dam reservoir, and there's this big spillway. Um, and this is the dam wall a bit closer up. So basically, a big dam like that has some major impacts, destruction of a huge amount of habitat, major changes in the downstream flow regime, major barrier to fish passage, and uh, a lot of fish mortality as well as fish go over the spillway. Um, this dam is actually built with steps on the spillway so there's these big steps that basically everything that goes over whacks into and gets their head bashed in so there's massive fish mortality in floods so we've got a lot of dams in Queensland um, in the Burnett which this dam is built on it's actually the most heavily developed um, river system in Queensland there's I think about 40 dams and weirs Paradise Dam went right in the middle, um, which is also the core of the habitat for a, a species called lungfish, which are endemic to two um, rivers, the Burnett and the Mary. So this is a lungfish. This is a very old fish. It's got a rudimentary lung, so it can breathe through gills, and it can also breathe through a lung. So it can actually gulp in air and um, absorb oxygen through it. And it's thought to be an, um, an evolutionary trait, possibly helping it in times of drought if you're you know if you're able to survive in a really 
um, shallow pond where there's low oxygen in the water by gulping air that possibly that helps you through. So they're really, they haven't changed in about 400 million years or there's fossil records going back 400 million years, uh, endemic to Queensland. Um, so because of lungfish and a whole range of other species and a lot of protest against this dam, the construction of the dam, the people constructing it agreed to build a fish way. Um, this is the entrance to the fishway. Now you might notice a problem. Can anyone point out to me the problem of this fishway? Now lungfish, great as they are, are not known for their flying abilities. Um, it took about three years for the water level to fill up the dam to reach the fishway. So to save money, they didn't build the entry lower on the fishway, so it took years for it to even start to operate. That's it in 2008, three years after the dam was opened, you notice that there's still a bit of a problem for any fish using it. Okay, and essentially what it was is it basically was like a big toilet. Um, fish, this fishway was, fish would, would, was meant to find that entrance, swim into it, and then <laughs> about every hour, they would flush it and the fish would go through this pipe and pass through and out a little pipe at the bottom. I'm not joking, this is actually, but the upstream one is even better because it's 40 meters tall. So, you know, those rock, you know, everyone's familiar with those little rock things that, you know, fish are meant to swim up and the like. Well, for a 40 meter, they only work on really low um, water infrastructure, but for a 40 million high dam, they simply, you can't have, you can't build a, a water course for fish to swim up. So what they did, first of a kind, they built, no joke, a lift. <laughs> and what this does is it sits in the water at the bottom and water is passed out in it, and then fish are meant to find the entrance, and then they get in it, and there's a little button that says up, and they use their flipper to come up. And they press the up button, and then the, the, the hopper, as it's called, lifts up and over the dam. Now, that's all true, except for one bit. Now, I bet you can't pick the bit that I made up. Yeah, it was the button. Okay, but the, the hopper is true. Uh, and um, uh, they spent about, this uh, was more than a Mickey Mouse effort. For a $260 million dam, they spent 20 million bucks on this fishway. It was a lot of money. One of the big problems though, they, it got them through the approvals for it, but one of the big problems they found was this thing broke down all the time. It's because to be effective, it's got to be operating 24 hours a day because fish are moving by day and night in all seasons. And basically it kept breaking down. So um, this is the hopper going up. So, th and that's a diagram, diagram of it to go over and they had a little fish could get out. So most, I mean, I laugh, but for most big dams, they simply don't have anything. They're just complete barriers to fish. So this is some data showing the red line is um, the downstream fishway and the blue line is the operation of the upstream fishway from 2005 to 2011. Around about the time when it was operating, I was involved in a big court case about the operation of the, the fact that the fishways weren't operating. Um, we lost the case uh, and so, so shortly afterwards there was a number of the big floods that damaged the fishways and the dam overall, the actual control tower all got flooded. Imagine you build a dam, um, 260 million bucks worth of dam, and you don't build it so it can withstand a flood. I mean, you might think that that was an error in your planning, but it happened. This big dam built 10 years ago, broken a, broken a flood, and it took them years to fix it. So I think the fishway might be back to operating, but in the over 10 years that the fishways have operated, they've actually, or sorry, the dam has been operational, the fishways have actually operated for less than 5% of the time that the dams existed. So basically they're useless. Um, and the other thing is fish, very few fish are using them and not big size classes as well. So you can throw a lot of money at something, but then it becomes a management nightmare 
and it actually doesn't solve your problem, it's just a band-aid. Um, I won't dwell on this, I could spend, in that lecture I spent a whole heap of time talking about the dam. The real, the salt and the wound for this dam is it was just a political bullshit exercise. The water wasn't needed, there was all this water infrastructure in the burnout already. The, basically the dam hasn't been used, it just sits there, kills a lot of fish and turtles and everything else, and the water is basically unused because there's enough water infrastructure already. So, yeah, in the first four years, basically zero water sales from it. And that was through the middle of a massive drought as well in the area. So, um, you can read about that. Don't want to dwell on it. Let's go on to just mention the Murray-Darling. So, the Murray-Darling, as you know, a massive river system stretching from Queensland through New South Wales, Victoria, and out through South Australia, Australia's biggest river system. Uh, I just like this image. I think it's really cool. You can see the um, Great Dividing Range running down the east coast of Australia and the river basin for the Murray. So, the area covered by the Murray-Darling Basin stretches from Queensland through New South Wales, Victoria, and South Australia. Anyway, in 2010, there was an attempt to have a Murray-Darling Basin plan because it had been massively over-allocated to water extraction. It became this massive political um, bun fight and there were these famous or infamous pictures of farmers when the Murray-Darling Basin Authority went around to give public presentations. They pretty well had to go into police escort and farmers stood outside and burnt copies of the Murray-Darling Basin plan. Politicians ran for the high hills, no one would support them. They took the Murray-Darling Basin Committee outside and they shot them one by one. And they're lying there in a ditch somewhere around on them. On them. <laughs> <They're not laughs> Sorry, I'm making that up too. <laughs> they did shoot them figuratively. Anyway, the Murray-Darling Basin Committee changed. They then had a second committee which produced a watered-down version. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, pretty well everyone lined up to kick the Murray-Darling <laughs> Basin Authority. And now we've got this weak plan, and you might have seen in the news in the last 12 months, there was a huge scandal in New South Wales where last year where the Environmental Defenders Office and some conservation groups learned that essentially the state government wasn't even enforcing water restrictions, that a lot of big water extraction was happening without any control, with, without even working metres on for water extraction. So there's, and Barnaby Joyce, who was then the um, Federal Minister for Water, said, I'm not interested in protecting the environment, I'm there to protect the farmers. So we've got this massive problem with enforcement on the Murray-Darling Basin Plan and it's teetering on the point of collapse. South Australia is livid because they're the ones that basically aren't getting the water. And it's a huge multifaceted problem that we've got nowhere near fixing. So the bottom line to take from that is managing water in coastal areas and fisheries is hard, it's got many components, it's very political. And the law reflects that. Okay, not dwelling on that, but I just want to mention climate change before going to our workshop. So ocean, climate change and ocean acidification. So I'm sure everyone's aware of the Paris Agreement, uh, agreed a couple of years ago in Paris, uh, famous uh, that now the globe has set a target of uh, holding um, mean global temperature rises beneath two degrees um, of pre-industrial levels and an aspirational goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius. So we're currently at one degree. Uh, a lot of um, science is now saying 1.5 degrees is basically impossible at this point, uh, and two degrees is also very hard to achieve. Um, the thing that really kicks me in the guts is that even at two degrees, um, basically coral reefs will be gone. So this is an image from a paper by Ophir Goldberg, who's a great professor here at the Global Change Institute at UQ. He was the lead author for a paper in science in 2007. They, they had three pictures of what coral reefs they thought would look like under current conditions on the left with about one degree warming. Coral reefs impacted, but still pretty healthy. At two degrees, pretty well weedy, sort of remnants of what they form of their former glory. And at three degrees, basically stuffed. And we've seen the impacts, so we're at one degree now. We've had three massive coral bleaching events 
98, 2002 and 2016, basically stretching across the reef. Um, it's been hugely impacted, it's strongly correlated with water temperatures. So this is from a paper by um, Terry Hughes and his colleagues. Terry's a great professor up in um, Townsville at JCU. So this was bleaching. So you can see there in 98, it was mainly in the middle and southern sections, same in 2002, 2016 was in the northern section. So if you look at the heat stress, you see for 2016, the heat stress is all up in the northern section. The thing about what 2016 really said though was, our northern section is the most pristine part of our reef. And it got hit for six by the bleaching event. So what that says is, as Terry summarised, in his paper in um, Nature in 2017 is there's no support for the hypothesis that good water quality confers resistance to bleaching. So for the last decade Australia's been saying oh climate change is too difficult to deal with what we're going to do for the reef is improve water quality, improve fisheries management. Well what 2016 told us is that's all a fairy tale that you can improve water quality and you you know it's I sort of use the analogy you might be healthy okay you guys all look healthy. If someone though walked in, pointed a shotgun and blew a big hole in your chest, it's going to kill you. It doesn't matter how healthy you are because the level of impact is so severe. Same for coral reefs. Bleaching is like a shotgun to their chest. So it doesn't matter you maintain their health through improved water quality, that's all great. Climate change is going to kill them. And it's going to kill them at two degrees, which is our bloody goal internationally. So we've set an international goal that we expect is going to kill the Great Barrier Reef. Put your hand up if you reckon that's a good goal. No one. No one would agree that that is a good goal, but that's the goal that we've set. And Australian government doesn't admit that. They say, oh, two degrees, we're still going to protect the reef. Well, the science says that's all just a fairy tale. Okay, and at present, the world isn't on track, even under current co commitments or pledges or nationally determined contributions under Paris, we're actually on track for 3.5 degrees. Um, we need to go a lot better even to reach 2 degrees. So we are in a complete um, bind for climate change. And, and to add salt to that wound, our policies are actually at a national level, the opposite of what we need to do. So we're still digging up, our, our national and state policies are still to dig up and burn all of our fossil fuels. So everyone would have seen the big campaign against the Adani mine going on at the moment. But basically, that mine has received, will be one of the biggest coal mines in the world, just approved in recent years. That mine has been approved at every level of government in Australia. They both support it, Queensland and the federal government. If it can get its finance, it's going ahead. So we're still approving these massive developments of fossil fuels, which are the opposite of what we need to do. It's crazy, like literally crazy, if you actually want to protect things like the Great Barrier Reef. So the current policies look grim, but what will climate policy look like in 2050? Well, I'd like to think there's hope, um, that it's all not grim, um, that I hope that it's going to get a lot better. I hope people like Donald Trump will be long gone and you know there might be some sanity internationally. Um, the good news is we are achieving sustainability in some areas. If you look at things like ozone protection, the world has succeeded in, in um, dealing with ozone depletion. Sure we've got ongoing work to do but we've turned that problem around and in some areas we, you know we're doing well. We need to, my focus for climate change is we need to provide positive solutions to address it. You need to really focus on, hey, there's a hell of a lot of jobs and um, positive solutions in this area. Because if we can convince people that there are jobs, you know, think about the research opportunities. We've got to repower nations. The amount of research, the amount of actual work for people, building wind farms, building and maintaining solar panels, repowering entire countries, it's enormous. So let's get on and do it. So focus on those solutions, because otherwise you just dwell on the problems. Okay, um, I want to move on to a workshop. Uh, so can I just summarise before I do that? Um, I went through a big 
few big chunks. I hope that that's useful to you. We started with the international um, layer, and the key thing to remember from that is UNCLOS and national maritime zones, exclusive economic zone, 200 nautical miles. If you can remember that, that's the key point. Then you drill down to our national laws, and it's a whole plethora. You can think of it like a smorgasbord of measures, and including marine protected areas, and then a whole range of restrictions on fisheries and, and things like um, commercial fishing licenses and restrictions on gear and the like. So there's a whole smorgasbord of things that we're doing. And then you also have got to recognise that fisheries is also linked to land development and things like dams and all of that is all interlinked. So think of it like a big jigsaw that we're building up the, to have an overall picture of the solution. And that solution is hard and it's complex scientifically, it's complex politically and socially, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of work in it. So for you guys, for your careers, whether you, you know, work for government or private industry, you know, there's a huge amount of work in, in this, just oodles of it. Good coastal planners, we need more of them. Do you agree? No, yeah. Oh, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Coastal planners. Somebody literally in the planning department in Queensland about this. <laughs> okay. Let's go on then to um, try and solve a few problems. Um, and I've got a couple of problems about maritime zones and then wanted to try and unpack, like if we wanted to go fishing somewhere in Queensland, what are the sort of controls and how do we find out about them? And particularly thinking about zoning plans around marine protected areas, that sound cool? Okay, so here's our first problem. Palau tiny Pacific nation, struggling to manage its fisheries sustainably, particularly due to illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing by high-tech foreign fishing vessels that entered Palau's maritime waters. Palau is party to UNCLOS. Um, let's explain what are the maritime zones, um, what are the high seas, and also is UNCLOS good at regulating fishing in national waters. This is a real problem, so it comes from there's a great documentary on Foreign Correspondent a couple of years ago, or more than a couple of years ago, uh, in 2014. It, it, uh, yeah, Palau, beautiful nation um, uh, east of the Philippines. And yeah, you've probably seen pictures of it. It just looks amazing. Um, this was the, the then president of um, um, Palau. I think he's still the president at the moment. Um, I saw a quote recently from the president of Palau. But anyway, um, great quote from him. Palau is so fragile and so beautiful. You just have to take responsible action to minimize the risk that would destroy all of this for our children and future children. And Australia, because Palau has great difficulty enforcing fisheries laws, Australia had donated to it a fishing vessel, a patrol boat, and they'd also essentially put a Australian skipper on board with um, Palau um, Coast Guard or Naval um, officers. So these guys were interviewed um, during the program. Great program if you want to go and look it up. I'll put the link in the slides. And it talked about how Palau was having a huge problem with these high-tech vessels basically scooting in out of the high seas, fishing, and then scooting back out. If the patrol vessel went out of port, there'd be like watchers in port, basically give a call to the, their vessels and the, all the vessels would just scoot out into the high seas. So basically the patrol boat was there, but they weren't catching anyone, but they knew there was a lot of fishing going on and they were, their fisheries were being hammered by these high-tech, fast fishing vessels. So in that context, what are the major maritime boundaries under UNCLOS? So it's a party, so what's its most important maritime boundary? The EZ. The EZ. So within that, it can control fisheries whether a vessel is registered in Palau or not. So if the vessel is registered in the Philippines and it's within the EZ, it can go and board it and search it and basically, you know, do you have a license from us? Have you taken too many fish? Those sorts of things. Once they're outside the EZ though, what can they do? If it's, say, a vessel registered in the Philippines or China? Nothing, basically. So the high seas then is anything outside the EEZ. Um, 
So what are the problems then you see with UNCLOS and wh what are the practical problems for Palau then in, in trying to protect its fisheries? Is it really the law? It is the law a bit because, yeah, the, the, whole, the whole EZ problem, but as much it's the technology because these vessels are so fast. But, but also, how would you overcome it? If you actually were going to overcome this problem, what are the sorts of things you could do? Just think of a few sort of vessel tracking, so mandatory vessel tracking. So you could prescribe that every vessel on the ocean, like on the high seas or you know, or they could be fitted with a vessel monitoring device. What about, you know, these are all pretty powerful vessels. Could you connect it to like the internet and, you know, have a camera of what they're doing, their catch? What other things could you require? Observers, yes, so international observers. Yep. What else? Well, record keeping. But what's the problem with record keeping? Budget. If you're a crook, you're gonna f you're gonna cook the books. So it's actually you can start to see the problems. So this mandatory vessel monitoring seems like a bloody obvious solution, but so many countries don't want it. So there's a huge problem with trying to get it in internationally under UNCLOS or any other regime. And if there is any country that stays out, then vessels can just go and register in that country. Uh, and it becomes really hard to then try and enforce it. Because, you know, once the fish are caught, you know, you can then, what they can then do is pass them through a country that, you know, like even if you outlaw, say you're Australia, and um, a country like the Philippines doesn't do it, so you say, well, we're not going to accept fish from the Philippines. So what you can then do is, say, take the fish to Japan, dock there, unload your fish, pass them through the Japanese fish markets, and the trace of where the fish actually came from is actually really hard to follow. So, you know, if then the fish can be imported from Japan, the illegal fishers can get around the controls by essentially just using other countries to hide where the fish came from. So it's actually really bloody hard. Okay, um, I mightn't do that one. Can I? That was a second maritime problem about China's islands. Let's look though at a national level. Say, sorry, say we want to go spearfishing in the Whitsundays. Anyone been to the Whitsundays? I'm Whitsunday boy, so if you haven't been to the Whitsundays, you definitely should go there. Best, got the best beaches in the world. Never, I haven't been to all the beaches in the world, but I, I know for a, a fact that Whitehaven Beach in the Whitsundays is the best beach. I sometimes see these international rankings of best beaches in the world, and there's some crappy beaches in Brazil that often get the, the top position, and I just know that the, the juries are rigged in those, um, those um, competitions because Whitehaven Beach is the best beach in the world. Anyway, the Whitsundays um, in North Queensland. Let's just say we want to go spearfishing. Um, at Grassy Island, which is just off, um, here's Airlie Beach. Um, Grassy Island is basically you head north from Airlie Beach and head to the west. Great little island. Um, that's me, um, my uncle and my brother back a long, long time ago. Um, and you can see I'm not very good with the spear gun. Um, we caught a mackerel and a coral trout and a couple of, and a, my brother caught a mackerel as well. So, we're on Grassy Island. If we were doing that today, um, would it be lawful? So, what are the sorts of things you've got to think of? What's a big thing? <coughs> yep, so where are we? The Whitsundays is in the midst of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, you can go to the Great Barrier Reef um, Marine Park website and download a zoning map. Look something like this. Find Grassy Island, which is there. You can see it's blue. So this is the 
typical key that they use. The actual law is a lot more complicated when you set it out in text, but this is the sort of key that they use in the zoning plans as a simple guide for people. So depending on the zone, different activities are regulated. So in the general use zone, you see that basically there's a lot of ticks. So if we go back to the map, you can see that that light blue, there's a lot of general use zone. And then the darker blue is habitat protection zone. There's still a lot of um, things permitted, but not trawling. So that's where you drag a big net across the bottom and pretty well destroy everything with a chain. So trawling for prawns. So um, in a habitat protection zone, no trawling, but everything else is permitted. And then all the way up to green zones, which are no take zones. And you can see there that basically everything is not permitted other than, well, traditional use of marine resources and photography, diving. And basically you can dive in, in, in green zones, but you can't take anything other than a photograph. So you get the idea. So if you go back to look at the Sundays, and we're in Grassy Island, what zone are we in? Habitat protection? Yep, so let's look down. In habitat protection, can anyone find spearfishing? See about halfway down? Limited spearfishing, snorkel only. So we could, you could go and find under the fisheries regulations, um, if you're spearfishing, there's um, one of the basic restrictions is you can't use scuba tanks. What do you think that is? You've got to be in snorkel. Because you've got to give the fish a chance. <laughs> basically, if you've got to swim down and hold your breath, it makes it harder. Where if you've got a scuba tank on, it's basically, you know, you can just follow the fish wherever. And so you can just stay there, down there and, you know, kill a lot of fish. So basically, spearfishing, we're making it harder by saying snorkel only. And there's some restrictions on things like exploding head and the like. And also you're subject to your same sort of bag limits, so the number of fish you can take. So if we were just taking two mackerel and a, and a coral trout, what other things might there be that control the, the take of those fish? So we know we're okay for the zone. We're only, we're only spearfishing with snorkels, so we didn't have scuba tanks. Sizes. So we'd have to check that they met the minimum size and what do you reckon? Are they going to meet the minimum size? Probably. Kick it out of the park. <laughs> and species. yeah, mackerel and coral trout aren't. There's some res restrictions on. I don't, I'm not. I, I don't fish anymore, um, so I'm not up to date with um, restrictions on coral trout uh, any longer. But you know, there's minimum sizes for it. This one would be over it, um, and uh, for mackerel. I don't think there's any closed seasons on them still. It might be. You'd have to go and check, basically. Basically, you, you have to check. If you're going to be in an area, the first thing you do is check the zoning plan. And then, basically, you're subject to a whole range of gear restrictions and how you do it. And basically, if a fisheries boat comes along, they can come on board and inspect your catch. And if you've got undersized or too many um, fish, then um, Basically, you can have be fined. Um, one of the other things that they require is you've got to keep the skin on the fish. Um, why do you think that is? So if you fillet the fish and then go back in, because typically the fisheries officers will wait at the boat, at the boat ramp. So all the boats come back. They, as you're pulling the boat out, they come up to you and say, "G'day, mate. How you going? Do you mind if we have a look at your catch?" And if you've taken, if you fillet the fish and taken their skin off, what do you think it's hard to do? Work out what type of fish it is. Yeah, so basically now you've got to leave the skin on the fish. You can fillet them out at sea, but you've got to keep the skin on the fish so that they can be ID'd until you're basically ready to consume them. So practical sort of restrictions. Does that sound OK? So a whole heap. But basically, if you're in an, in an area, you can walk into, you know, you can either check online or go into a, a fishing shop. They generally have 
a range of you know zoning maps and basic pamphlets explaining what are the main restrictions and size limits, closed seasons, those sorts of things. They can tell you, you know, what are the restrictions in an area, and you get to know it. So you know, everyone knows you don't take female crabs, that sort of stuff. Cool. Any questions on that problem? Okay, so wrapping up because we're out of time. So we've covered range of components relevant to fisheries laws and policies in Queensland. Started with that overall frame and it suggested thinking about it like a jigsaw puzzle you're building up. International level is important under UNCLOS EZs. Then there's, there's all these laws at a national and, and state level. Climate change is this big uh, issue that we're not dealing well with and it's going to have big impacts in the, into the now and into the future. Key message I'd like to leave you with is coastal managing coastal fisheries and coastal areas is hard, has many components and is very political. And the law, law reflects that, both in what is said on paper and what happens in practice. So think of this as like a big jigsaw that you're solving. And it, I hope that you find that little diagram of the four layers really useful as a way of basically seeing all the bits and then drawing them together in your problem solving. It's a, I think it's a good way to conceptualise the overall system. So I hope that's been really useful for you. Um, thanks, guys. Uh, yeah, sorry that I finished a little bit late.